Hi, here we are again. Uh, I do hope you're getting as much fun out of these as I get doing them. I, I, I've often thought that, you know, the person who's in a field that he belongs in is the guy who just, you know, that's what he thinks about morning, noon, and night. Can't talk enough about it. Can't spend enough minutes with somebody else hearing about it and sharing notes or, or challenging, debating, whatever uh, the issues. So. And yet, painting isn't a talking sport, right? It's, <laughs> it's why there's so little writing. And you, it, was, it was good days back in Paris, I guess, when, uh, when people like Degas would be sitting around with two or three other guys and they'd be talking, as it were, a shop, you know, when they would be talking about stuff related to what they were doing, what other painters were doing in their day. Um, and I guess we do that uh, individually, you know, with each other, talking about what we've seen in a, in a magazine somewhere or, or, or what we saw at the museum. Um, so you get that, and yet there's so little writing on painting written by painters. Um, I do recommend uh, that you read, if you haven't read Kenyon Cox's work, there's five different books, uh, and of course anything Gamble's written uh, is good. Read, read Da Vinci's notebooks, read the, especially from the point of view of understanding what we are in terms of Impressionism, do read uh, uh, R.A.M. Stevenson, fellow student of Sargent's, R.A.M. Stevenson on Velasquez. Uh, read Hale, who was one of the Boston School guys. Read Hale's book on Vermeer, which is highly recommended by Gamel, and um, and it was actually co sort of um, not authored, but uh, but um, but Paxton played a role in um, analyzing Vermeer, and had definitely had an effect on on what came out in in uh, Hale's work. So. Those books, you know, anytime you hear a painting talking about painting, you have Collier's book, you know, or uh, Reynolds, both former heads of the, uh, of the um, Royal Academy in London. Um, Reynolds, you know, chapter 11, uh, genius lies in seeing the thing as a whole. I mean, this, there's, there's miraculously important stuff there. At some point or another, Gamel translated uh, Degas, the shop talk, but he also translated for us as students the... Um, the notes of Amari Duvall related to Ang, and um, so there's there's some writing out there, but I'll tell you it's um, it's until you know that you know you just you know you stare blankly around and sort of miraculously accidentally come across something here and there. So, but there's a lot, and uh, I, that's a whole conversation unto itself, which I've almost taken up all our time with here today. So let me get on with the point. Uh, the question of the hour is: Is color subjective? And that's a good question for anybody talking Impressionism. Um, and a lot of people want uh, want it to be a uh, you know want it to be a, a, a one way or the other kind of an answer. I, I would suggest to you that there are many different w reasons to think about that question, though. And they don't give you automatically one way versus the other uh, as far as um, uh, best ways to think about it, but. There are a couple different points that I think are important to be made. And one is, is color subjective? Um, do our people's eyes differ from each other's eyes? Yeah. Uh, women have a, as I understand it, women have a greater uh, a dedication of br a, a brain mass to color. And so, and apparently more cones than men. And there's more color blindness among men than among women, and, and just in general, there's a whole variety of kinds of, of um, limits for everybody. Um, so doesn't that just change everything? Well, you know, you could say so, except the silly thing is when you look at pictures, you don't actually see a problem. Um, you take a guy like Vermeer or other people, what you'll see is their color relations are, are just like yours. Um, and one of the ways I find useful to think about this is that if, as an Impressionist, you know, and even in the general question of what seeing is in painting, what a student has to do, meaning he has to learn to see, he just simply has to learn to see relationally. So every, everyone's eyes will tend, if they have a full range of cones, and I don't I believe me, this isn't science, but my experience with students is all I can base this on. But I have not found that I find that over the course of a few, uh, if anybody's having a tr trouble, a few years, you can actually come to conclusions that are the same. In other words, you can say, this is more red, yellow, or blue than that, and of these blues, that is, this one is the reddest of the blues, that's the greenest of the blues. 
And so those relationships are staying, right? That's the most chromatic of these. Well, if you're looking relationally, those things seem not. I've not had a problem. My students will all gradually come around to seeing, uh, to coming to an agreement that once they understand the idea of what chroma is, that yes, this is the more chromatic. And by the way, I mean intensity or saturation. Uh, some people call it brightness, but that's not a good word because it implies values. But, but the intensity, the saturation of a color, we tend to agree that this one's more saturated than that one. Uh, saturation versus, versus relative neutrality, lack of saturation. And uh, those things aren't, they don't seem to be debatable. So it's really just a question of whether you can get the proportions that, of what the group of things is that you see in front of you, you can get that proportion right. So relatively speaking, this is the most chromatic, that's second, that's third, and this whole scenario, you know, of the, or of the reds, that's the most orange red, and this is the bluer red, this is the set of the reds as they relate to each other. Uh, so that's no more problematical than getting the size relationships, for example, if you realize that it's a problem of relationships. Um, but that's the one side of the question that has everything to do with, do you believe you can work with somebody and can somebody actually improve your ability to see? Yeah, well, if seeing is seeing relationally, then yes, somebody definitely can improve your ability to see. Somebody who knows how to see, somebody who knows how to see relationally can improve your ability to see relationally, which means you should be able to get a good color um, a good, the, the set of the relationships of the colors, you should be able to adjust until there's a general agreement among people. The history of painting tells me that that has already been the case. Now, there's a different side to this, and that is, is color subjective in the sense of use of color? Yeah, it's totally subjective. <laughs> I mean, the, um, the way the, um, the, uh, the, um, well, in the day of Vermeer, the way some people used color versus the way Vermeer used color, well, that was very interesting. Now, you could say, was it subjective? Well, yeah, it was subjective in this way, and that is that those, some of those guys determined to have a preconceived palette. They painted with a set of colors. And by the way, Monet isn't this guy who lived at a particular time when all these new colors were evolving like Monet. Not at all. But, for the, but he seems to be the guy who really, it's arguable, it, it's arguable for the first time, so fully accurately relationally. On the other hand, I mean, you talk about Titian and other people, as evidence that people saw better. But th what tends to happen is people buy into formulas, and they, so they'll look for skin color X. I did, I did have a, a student once say to me, um, can you just tell me what color skin is? And I, and I said, well, I, I don't think I can. And she said, and she shook her head and she said, uh, and she said, um, you artists, you just keep all your best secrets for yourselves, right? <laughs> and it was just so funny because, because if I were to give her a formula for color and say the skin is X, well, she would paint her skin X all day long and some person's skin X would be bluer, so another person's skin X would be more golden and another one should be redder <laughs> and some one would be warmer. I mean, I mean, like what? Now, if we're talking about an honest assessment of somebody's color relations, right? What's even funnier, by the way, when it comes to skin tones is if you put, you can take somebody with any skin tone you want and if you put a certain color behind that person, and it'll be different for different persons, but if you say put a particular red behind a person, anybody practically, their skin will go dead. It'll look dead. Now, what is your formula going to look right in front of that person? May or may not, but probably <laughs> in front of that uh, material. It's an interesting question, though. So, but the subjective part of color entirely is in the subject matter. So when you're doing an imaginative painting, and I suggest to you that that's your best venue for doing this kind of thing. When you're doing an imaginative painting, not painting from life, uh, but even if you were painting from life, when you're doing an imaginative treatment, which means you're making it up out of your head, yeah, you could say that this theme wants to be more neutral than, my, than I can possibly set up in this room. It wants to be, have fewer chromatic notes. It wants to be, you know, and so you find, because it's a melancholy picture, that you're going to use colors that are diminished, you know, that are more living in a, more, a, a less chromatic range. When you're doing a, some other kind of a very sort of a happy picture, you might live in a more elevated chroma much like a sunny day in a flower garden. You know, you might live with a set of colors like that. Those are subjective choices. And uh, one can always take a drawing, especially an imaginative painter does. You can take a drawing, do all the grisaille work to it, have sort of the whole thing finished as it were in black and white, and then just invent a color scheme.
And frankly, when I was working with Gamble, I did that once. At one point, I had a set of, I, I was doing a Jason and the Golden Fleece with a dragon and that sort of thing, and I painted, and I painted it impressionistically, and it looked so absolutely stupid. That was the first day I really fully understood what, how different imaginative painting is and why it had to do something else with its color. And um, it was it, and it, because because it just looked odd and goofy. It wasn't it wasn't removed enough from us. You know, even though I was painting Greek figures, they looked like Greek figures that looked like people in costumes today. Because I was painting with modern, you know, Monet-like color relationships and life. So that's a that's a reality. And anybody who's doing illustration would be aware of that. And, and anybody who's doing, by the way, who's doing murals on walls, the wall wants to have its color scheme. So that's subjective. It's size subjective. In other words, the color scheme of the wall, if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a gray room, then you're going to probably live with all your tones or variations on that gray or living within a, a scope that actually is comfortable with that gray. And so if you see what I'm saying that way, you could say it's subjective. It's actually subject to change from truth about nature, which is the basis of all Impressionism, to now being good to look at in a, in a um, decorative sense. So in that sense, yeah, go ahead and have your have your sweet time with it, um, uh, and have your subjectivity, as it were, right? I like the word subject in that way. If it's being influenced by subject, you know, which isn't precisely what that means, but but is it subjective? My answer is uh, is that it's it's to it's it's that the relationships actually aren't. I think the relationships are factual, and everybody can get them who has a reasonable number of combs. So thank you, David, very much for that question. And by the way, I want to say, um, be sure to subscribe, comment, uh, like, all those things. Um, and also, you, know, you don't have to ask questions if you don't want in your comments. You can actually debate. You can make a point. I mean, I don't want to read three pages or anything. Like that, but if you want to make a point or two in, in, um, in, in, as like a point of debate, I would be eager to have that conversation. So um, thank you all very much, and I'll see you next time.